Hey everybody, Preston Brent here with our weekly roundup. This is for the trading week ending March 1st, 2019. So essentially it's the first two months of the year, March 1st being Friday of this past week. This is truly going to be a shootout at OK Corral between the bulls and the bears. <laughs> this week was relatively flat, however, S&P is up about 39 basis points, that's 0.39%. The Dow was slightly, it was flat basically, it was down about two basis points. Um, NASDAQ was up about nine basis points. The RUT was down about one basis point. So relatively flat market. Same thing for volatility, it was up just one basis point. It finished the week at 13.55. Last week's close was 13.51. So this past week we've been trying to get up above the 2800 <laughs> we had managed to close above it <coughs> for the week excuse me got a bit of a cough here um, we managed to close above the 2800 level but volatility's been you know staying around the 13 and a half percentage level from a sector performance this week um, technology was up about 94 basis points materials was the worst performer um, coming down 1.73 and then just looking at valuations, the current P.E. ratio is about 16.2. And that compares with same time last year, about 18.5. Um, so we've had a reduction in valuations um, year, year over year, about a little over 10 percent, slightly under 11 percent. So um, the markets, these first two months, January and February, I mean, these are just outstanding months. I mean, they just they blew higher. The first two months of this year, it's the best performance we've had in January and February since 1999. But of course, you got to keep this in context because it's also coming off the worst December we've had <laughs> since 1931. So as a result of this bounce, <laughs> we kick off 2019. The Fed fund futures is essentially pricing in a rate hike by this coming December of only about 2%. I mean, that is, that for all practical purposes, uh, we've, pretty much taken away higher higher interest rates for the remaining part of this year. The only thing that can affect that now is just what the Fed's policy is going to be on quantitative tightening, and, and Power Ranger Powell has told us he's going to be coming out with that shortly. So for 2019, just looking at the year, the S&P is up a little over 11%, again, making it the best start since 1991. And that's coming off the worst drop in December since 1931 of 9.1%. And yet, despite all of this in January and February, the S&P just finished only about 1.6% above where it ended on November 30th. So if you look at the past three months, from November 30th to end of February, we've only moved up 1.6%. So a lot of that move... Uh, is attributable to the um, the words and the the deeds of the U.S. Federal Bank, Central Bank, <clears throat> with Power Ranger Powell, and we're still off the uh, September 17th highs of 4.75 percent. Um, and the other number that we saw coming in this past week to round out the end of February, we saw real GDP come in for Q4 around 2.6, yet the full year 2018 GDP coming in at about 2.9%. So that gave us the best annual GDP number for over a decade. So, you know, the markets here are in this push-pull because the other thing that is going to start to weigh on the markets depending on what the political structure is and where we're going to go from here is the u.s national debt hit about 22 trillion in february and in 2018 we ended the year around 20.5 trillion in debt um, yet given all of that interest rates are steering still near historic lows we're at about 2.85 2.7 2.8 somewhere in that area inflation is still staying under two percent jobless rate around four um while the global debt of uh, uh all the other major uh, con uh, countries here is over 50 trillion um, and we're still seeing 11 trillion of the global debt still below zero percent interest rates so we've got this push pull going on between the bulls and the bears and 
And it could be that the Bulls may win near term. But as I've always said, longer term, um, markets always self-correct to the fundamentals. Uh, it's just the way the nature of the capitalistic um, uh, monetary engine works. Um, and speaking of this, we now have the entire theory of modern monetary methods. Um, and that when I talk about that, I'm talking about manipulated interest rates, uh, asset values levitated higher based on the movement of interest rates by the central banks and the supposed necessity of a target inflation rate of 2%, all under discussion, uh, and rightfully so. Um, and it's going to be a big political debate coming up um, in um, 2019, 2020, going into the next presidential elections as to where we take this country from a monetary perspective and from a um, fiscal perspective. Um, and it's going to it's going to pay everybody big to really just kind of keep track with this because it could get out of hand. So anyway, what you're looking at on the screen right here. <coughs> is a weekly chart of the E-mini S&P 500 futures. And you can see that big move down, right? I mean, it's just, this was the V pattern that I was talking about right here, right? That everybody's so familiar with. And we've effectively ended the V pattern. And we're now sitting at this level right here. And in order to get the escape velocity to come up and challenge these highs here, we're going to need participation. A lot of the... Uh, China trade deal is already priced in the market, but and I think there's a little bit of this FOMA uh, going on here on this back side of the V pattern here where we've kind of pushed it up a little bit. It's a little bit stretched, but we can go higher. Um, the feds have essentially taken themselves out of the game for the remainder of the year for interest rates, so that's given the markets no place else to go. You remember the old acronym TINA? There is no alternative other than just going into either cash or equities. And that seems to be where we're sitting right back now at the beginning of 2019. Um, now, a lot there's a lot of geopolitical risk out there. Um, beside the fact we have the Brexit um, debacle coming up over in, Mar in March this month uh, in Great Britain, the money, big money, and just looking at the currency markets and, and, and the pound. The markets believe the politicians are going to push it out in time, and then at that point, they may even have a do-over, which would be catastrophic for the voters in Great Britain. But that is pretty much where, where we're sitting right now um, on that. Uh, and then the other big issue is we got the China trade deal coming up. So if that does happen, I think that'll give us the necessary oomph. We've got to get the escape velocity, make new 2019 highs, and challenge the highs made back on September 17th. So that's kind of what I'm looking at here on this weekly chart. Uh, we've got to be very careful, though, because, you know, if I take it down to a tighter time frame here, let me just let me just take it down um, to a weekly chart here just to show you guys. And then I'll take it in even tighter. You can see here uh, going all the way back to the middle of February. And if you just look at these bars and the, cro the closing bars here, we haven't really moved that much. I mean, we were at 27.80 on February the 15th, and now here on March 1st, we're at 28.05. So we've moved up about 25 points over the course of, um, you know, a couple of weeks. We haven't really moved much. And then if I take it down to a two-hour chart, um, if I take it down to a two-hour chart, um, you can see here that... Um, uh, let me just move it down here, uh, two-hour chart here. You can see on this two-hour chart, we've challenging um, right here, this the value over um, or volume over price. You can see where most of it is sitting right around 27.90. But we've made several runs at the 28 or the 2800 to 28. Uh, 20 area and we failed every time so i believe to get escape velocity to get it back up above this um we're just going to need to get some more catalysts to move it up i think the china trade deal there's already rumors floating from the uh, trump officials or the trump administration <clears throat> they're looking to set up a meeting with uh, chi some sometime in mid-march at mar-a-lago if he does set up that meeting that means they're gonna sign something but 
you know, we got to be really careful. But if that is a go and it looks like tariffs are coming off the table, that'll give us the escape velocity to really move much higher. OK, so that's kind of what I'm looking at for the E-minis. Um, and then, of course, if we look at the Dow, which uh, from a chart perspective, it looks the best. Let me just go back to a daily chart here. Now, we're looking at the EMAs and you can see where um, the 50 is going to cross the 200 next week. Um, and they should and it's providing a support right around the 2700 area. That is also where most of the volume has taken place going back over 90 days right around the 2780 or 2700, 2710 area. Um, if we look at the Dow, uh, the Dow uh, looks even stronger from a chart perspective. Um, if we look at the Dow, you can see here in the Dow, we're much closer to the all-time highs in the Dow than we are with the other indexes. And we've also had a cross in the 50 and the 200. Uh, back uh, last week. Now it's starting to get show a little bit of tiredness here and a little bit of a pullback can be expected across most of these indexes. Um, but that's kind of what I'm seeing. Everything is still um, bullish right now. So that's a little bit about what we're looking at um, in these. And then of course if we look at NASDAQ, NASDAQ is showing the same thing. We should get across in the 50 over the 200 next week. It's challenging as 2019 highs. You can see here the all time highs. We still have a ways to go there, so it's not as strong as the Dow. And then finally, if we look at the Russell, I'll take a look at the Russell futures. Um, you can see here with the Russell futures. Um, again, we're challenging our our annual highs for this year, but we're well off of um, well, I guess not. I guess we're we're pretty. Um, uh, let me just back it out for a week here. Uh, let me take a look at this here. You can see the all time highs in the Russell. I didn't have it on my chart, but I'll just I'll put it in a little bit later. But the all time highs for the Russell were made back in um, uh, early September, uh, and it led the Russell led the market down right around the uh, uh, 1746 area. So we still have about another hundred and. and 43 points or so to go to take out these prior highs. Okay, so that's what I'm looking at for the markets here. Now, if I shift and look at these charts kind of from a different perspective, uh, let me just show you here on the Bollinger Bands here. Um, let's get it right here like this. So if we look at a three standard D Bollinger Band around the E-minis on a daily chart, you can see here um, when we had this natural compression right here as markets moved higher like this, uh, finally we exploded to the downside in October and then volatility just came back into to, to the forefront. And then off of the intraday lows on December 26, we've exploded higher, volatility's coming in. You can see the FIB nodes here. A normal to me pullback uh, point here is right around the 2700. So at 23, uh, uh, FIB level, 23.6 FIB level will take us down to 26.96, so call it 2700. That would be a normal pullback. We've got an Elliott Wave 3 moving up here that would suggest, you know, the way the Elliott Wave theory is running, uh, that we have a three leg, then we pull back to a four leg, and then we make a five leg, right? Um, and that just gives you the wave count. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So I think a lot of big money's waiting for that four leg to get on board to take that final catalyst higher. Um, now the three leg does not have to pull back at this level. It could move up a little bit higher and just get a little bit more um, um, uh, supersonic uh, before it has that four leg pullback and then we make that final run higher. Um, there's still a lot of cash on the sidelines. There's still people that don't believe in this rally. In fact, a lot of people got out of the markets as we were. We were coming down um, right here in um, um, uh, the Q4, primarily December when we really crashed down. So I'm looking at this, and then I'll show you one other view. Um, and by the way, if, if I blow this up a little bit and we just take it in, you can see a common point here. I'm using three standard deviations on my Bollinger Band. So we've been riding this uh, one, one standard deviation has kind of been the upward track. Uh, the blue uh, line, the purple is two standard deep, the red is three standard deep off the center line here. So to me, the center line, and we haven't been on the center line since uh, January 7th. So 
you know, we're going to come back, touch that. And then the center line gives us right around 2750, okay, as a common, very simple, easy resting period. And I think part of the catalyst of going higher is we're going to need that resting period. Um, <clears throat> And a little bit of a pullback to entice more bulls back into the market. Now, if I show you the other chart, which I, I we use this also in our in our user group, is the um, Ichimoku. And if you look at the Ichimoku here, um, you're going to see a number of different lines on here. But just pay attention to a couple of really simple ones here. In our option masters, we spend a lot of time you know, dissecting what every individual line means and how to interpret it and how to trade the Ichimoku. But if you look at the red line and the blue line, when the red line crosses the blue line, it's a buy signal going up and a sell signal going down. So you could see the Ichimoku would have gotten us out of the markets in early October for this big run lower, right? Um, and even though we had uh, these moves higher over the blue line, it would have gotten us back out again. You know, it would have attempted to treat this as a buy the dip mode. It would have gotten us out. And then when we had the, the red cloud here, we wouldn't have taken the trade unless we moved over it. And we didn't. So we would have stayed out of the trade and we would essentially would not have gotten back in to right around January 14th. You would have missed a big part of this bounce right here on a daily chart if that's what you were trading. We could have gotten in sooner trading it earlier, but we would still be um, bullish uh, using the Ichimoku and this real simple trading method. There's others that we combine with this to give us you know, more shorter term assurity of, of what we're doing. But you can see here now, you can see the width of the zone here. So this just tells me that, you know, it's very bullish and it gives us a solid support point right around the 2560, 2570 area on a daily chart. And it may sound like a lot, but it's not given the movement that we've had on this V bottom down and V bottom back up. Now, the near term support for us is sitting right around 2710 here, which is exactly um, the support point I see on the Bollinger Bands of 2696, and then on the the um, value over price uh, or volume over price of 2710 on the um, uh, the other one where I'm using volume over price is is helping determine key levels. So <laughs> the, just north of the 2700 is a solid support area no matter what chart you're looking at. But we use multiple charts to give us clues as to directional um, bias and, and, and you know what could be the next move and where is the support and resistance uh, zones. So these are just some of the things that we use that I think are, are uh, very good. Um, now, if I come back over, and let's come back to our original chart here again. I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. One, I wanted to just kind of show you volatility. If we look at the VIX, the VIX is back down into the green zone again, but just barely. Okay, keep in mind when we go into the green, it's different option strategies that we use, and each color code just signifies a different strategy that we want to deploy. Okay, um, and generally when we move out of the green into the yellow, and then we move into the red, clearly up into the red here, the deeper red, we stay nor we it usually takes us three months to four months to come back into the green again and the green being the dividing line around 15 on the vix okay below the 15 level and this is normal guys now the other thing that we use in trading vxxb and just looking at some of the fear out in the market is near term and back term fear near term is the the front month uh, vol skew volatility skew and on my chart here generally the way i've got this this um constructed on my chart when we're in the red we're in a um uh, uh, a backwardation market when we're in the green <laughs> it's a normal market and we're in contango meaning the back month is higher than the front month in this case this is the front month vol skew and if we look skew and if we look at the back month vol skew um, you'll see we're well in the green so the fear is pretty much coming out of the market we're in a normal um contango uh, environment so the skew is normalized right now uh, it does not we're in a buy the dip mode okay I mean that's clearly the mode that we're we're playing right now um, now the other one that I wanted to show you is bonds bonds have really come down a pretty good little bit we broke this this zone here and you can see this big pivot in this green bar we broke it and we came down here now we're testing the 200 EMA 
Um, we've got a support point down here around 142, and then the next big value area is 139. Okay, if I were to put it on a weekly chart, um, you can see on a weekly chart we are sitting right at the major value area of about 144. Right, you can see this yellow line. That's where all the volume took place, going back 90 weeks. Um, Okay, so that is a lot of volume sitting here. Now, the Elliott wave count would suggest that we're going to come down here and then make another run higher, which would suggest interest rates are going to go lower, which would suggest um, money coming back into um, uh, the bond market, which would suggest the equity market's going to pull back, which would give us that four leg that we would be looking for in the U.S. equities market. Okay, so that's kind of what, what I'm looking at there. And then, of course, if we look at currencies, the U.S. dollar, um, it had a strong day on uh, Friday. Uh, you can see here, looking at the dollar, we've been essentially in a very wide range. I do not like the euro. I never really have. Um, I think over time, the euro is just going to fade away and move back down to parity, even below parity with the dollar. But near term, central banks are playing their reindeer game, so anything can happen. Right now, we're showing the dollar just moving up a little bit. And then, of course, the euro is just the opposite of that. If I show you the euro here, you'll see that the euro has just been making a series of lower highs as we come down. <laughs> and it's got this descending triangle set up here that I think it can move a little bit lower. Excuse me. Um, oil, energy. Now, I had called oil at the mid 55 level, right? And we got all the way up here to around 57.86, almost 58. And we closed Friday at 55.75. I think it's going to have really a hard time getting up here. There's still a lot of geopolitical risk out there, primarily with Venezuela. They've got, you know, there's been reports of over a dozen oil tanker sitting off the coast with Venezuelan oil. It's just sitting there. It's nowhere to go because countries don't want to take them because of the sanctions that the U.S. has put on them. Those countries, if they take that oil, then they're going to be punished by the U.S. sanctions. So they don't want to take it. So there's nowhere for that oil to go. So they're hurting <laughs> in Venezuela. Um, if, that, if those sanctions are lifted, and Trump's not going to lift them unless Guaido comes into control, which he may. Then I think you're going to see oil come back down a little bit because all those tankers are going to be released. It's going to flood the market um, with with a lot of oil. And um, he's going to want to get as much oil revenue as he can. So he's going to flood the market. and You'll see oil come back down a little bit more. So I am not a big believer in and, and a bullish bias for oil, at least not much more than the $60 uh, 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 dollar per barrel uh, level uh, in the oil markets. Okay, And that's a little bit, there are other things that we're tracking in energy. We're looking at nat gas. We're looking at gasoline. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go through them this, this time here. And then, of course, if we look at precious metals, um, we look at gold. Gold is forming its handle on a cup and handle pattern if i were to put it on a let's just put it on a weekly chart here you can see right here this is the textbook case of a cup and handle now remember just because i'm pointing out the pattern doesn't mean the pattern is going to be successful um but when they are it's a good trade right and now we've got that now we're getting the makings possibly of a cup and handle pattern I've got all the volume sitting right here going back 90 weeks, sitting about 1280, right? So if we form that pattern, the typical move from this point right here is about 10% higher. And that would put us up another 130, 140 points, taking us up to the 14, uh, almost 1480, 1500 level, should it break. OK, so we're getting this pullback because of a stronger dollar, because the markets are just going um, uh, very strong to the upside. So generally, when you have a strong bull market, gold tends to underperform. Same thing with a strong dollar. Gold tends to underperform. But I do believe that it's going to it's going to get its uh, legs back again after this 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 um, sell the rally kind of attempt. Now, down in this area down here, as you guys remember, I was telling everybody to sell puts out of the money and play this up because this was the right-hand side of a cup and uh, handle pattern. And the right-hand side, you don't need to wait for that pullback to take a trade up here. You could play the right side of the pattern. And that was what I was um, 
uh, having for our members here. So that was kind of what we're what I'm looking at here across these markets. The other one that we're looking at is palladium. You can see palladium here is just a rocket ship straight up. And I'm looking for some really good action here to the downside. You can see this exhaustion bars coming up here. Now the downside with palladium is if you want to trade it or you want to trade the ETF, P-A-L-L, -L, there are no options on it. There's not even options on it in the ETF market or in the futures market. That means there's no way to hedge long. So the only way you can play this is go long or short. And most people right now are long palladium. So being long palladium is one of those situations where <clears throat> the only way out is to sell. If you had a lot of puts, you could uh, hedge the bet. But that's the only way. So there's going to be a time and place for that also. Now, uh, for our members, we've updated our website. We put in our new learning management system. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. We've got a lot of great things going on. Members, I'll see you uh, tomorrow night for our weekly market watch. Otherwise, everybody have a great weekend. Members, I'll catch you uh, tomorrow night. Take care, folks. Ciao.